preconceived ideas. And uh, if there's ideas that uh, you want us to change some beliefs, help us to do that. But help us not to make a big deal about it. I mean, if we just happen to agree with your word on an occasion, that's, that's a plus. But uh, I just pray you'd help us to understand your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Psalm 1. I'm going to try to go pretty uh, detailed. And the reason why Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth when he is sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate. Day and night. Meditate. Okay, that is a careful, to think carefully about. And the way the Lord writes this book, he will make statements that hopefully we scratch our heads on many occasions. So in Genesis 1, there are many things we need to scratch our heads on to try to figure out. But it lays a pretty powerful foundation uh, as, if we do understand it, at least throw a bunch of verses to try to understand it. Okay, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved. Unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And so uh, when we get to Genesis 1, right at the foundation or the genesis of the book, the Bible, the genesis of history, the genesis of the genders, animals, language, it's the genesis of everything. And so uh, we try to figure it out. And basically, what I'm going to give you a quick little brief review or preview, Genesis 1 and 2 appears to take about 2,000 years at the most. Okay, so I'd say approximately that. Okay, and then chapter, verse 3 starts a six or seven day creation story. Okay, and so some will call that a gap, but when you read the creation story of 24-hour days starting in verse 3, there's no mention of a creation of the devil, angels, or water. Where did all that come from? Okay, so when was the devil created? When did he fall? Uh, you can't pin it within that six or seven day creation. It's got to have something else going on. And again, if a person doesn't want to believe it, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, Kent Hovind and Ken Ham, those guys are deathly against the gap. And then they malign the gap proponents in that they say, oh, we're just theistic evolutionists trying to make it a million and so years. No, I think maybe at the tops an extra 2,000 at the top. Okay, because it seems like it takes the devil about 2,000 years to get his ball of wax going. From Adam to the flood, from flood to Christ, from Christ to now. So it's about 2,000 years. So that that's kind of my premise, and we'll go a little further into it. Hopefully we approach the Bible diligently, diligently. Jesus said uh, that, he said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So every single word is important, and we want to be diligent. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the, uh, the Lord stated that if we diligently seek after the Lord, the Lord will reveal himself. Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, what kind of a diligence are we talking about? If you would, try Deuteronomy chapter 13. Americans are very diligent in their email addresses. Right? Right? Making sure we get every space or no space, dot, letter, uppercase, lowercase. Very diligent at Very diligent. Painters got to be very diligent when they mix the colors, different colors. Okay, people are very diligent about what they like. So we need to be diligent of the Bible. 
What kind of a diligence are we talking about? Okay, I'm talking about in chapter 13 of Deuteronomy. This is a diligence of researching a false doctrine of the day. Deuteronomy 13, verse 14. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently and behold if it be truth and the thing certain that such abomination wrought among you. But that's pretty diligent. Now he he mentions that same idea of this diligence in later on in chapter 17 verse 4 in a court structure. If you've never been uh, a visitor in a courtroom, I would encourage you to do that, especially in a law case, because it's good education. Jan served on a jury many years ago. Uh, it was a case where somebody fell backwards into the swimming pool and hurt themselves. Twenty-three months later, they filed a case. Two years, 24 months is statute of limitation. 23 months later, he still had a cast and everything in court. Trying to get millions of dollars. And of the six jury people, they said, Zippo. <laughs> that dude got zip. But it was good education. Chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, verse 4. And it be told thee, and thou hast heard of it. Okay, this is about... Again, a false doctrine. Inquire diligently, and behold, it be true and a thing certain that such abomination brought in Israel. If you go into a court setting, especially if it's a trial, which attorneys don't want to do these days because they're too lazy, uh, if you sit and listen to the first half of the trial, you think, oh, man, that guy is guilty, guilty of sin, guilty. And then leave thinking he's guilty. If you didn't hear the other side, you'll, they'll come up with arguments you never even dreamed of. And then you get to wonder. And so there's almost always, when you get in a discussion, there's almost always you can boil it down to two choices. Almost always. Okay? And uh, a person needs to be very prudent in our studies, prudent, the English language often will have words that uh, uh, rhyme or similar, and they mean very similar. Uh, we say he's an old prude, and they, the devil will use these as a bad thing, but prudent in the Bible is a good thing. A prudent is somebody who's a student. And a prudent man looketh well to his going. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent looketh well to his going. And then he says, and the prudent concealeth knowledge. You know there are sometimes you don't need to let people know what you know. A lot of people think I got this great doctrine and they want to tell everybody real quickly what this great idea is. They don't care. And the Lord told the apostles, you're not ready for some things. And he hid some things from the apostles. They weren't ready for it. And I'm not saying if we come up with, we got a couple of very unusual ideas when we come through this chapter. And, you know, I'm not suggesting to run out here and tell everybody what you learned. Uh, just keep it under your hat. Or if you got a toupee, under your toupee. But uh, just wait for the Lord to give you the opportunity. But most of the time, uh, a general overview here, or preview, Genesis 1, 1, God created. Verse 2, Satan destroyed, God judged, and then God created, made, formed, and said. There's four different things he did. Four different things, and they are different. Very slight differences. Okay, created, made, formed, said, all are written in past tense. So the writer is writing everything in past tense. Okay, the writer Moses, according to Jesus, in Luke 24. So he's writing everything in past tense. And when we come through it, we're gonna, and we're going to see that verses 1 and 2 will be, I don't know how long, but it's definitely not millions, definitely not billions. I would say tops, tops, 2,000 at tops. 
That would make perfect sense with God as far as his numbering days. Okay? Um, where Israel would have 7,000 years or whatever, man, you know, discounting the church time period as a parenthesis. But still, and then when you get to verse 3, he creates, some would say recreates, but he creates, he made, he formed, and he said some things in there. Those are dealing with 24-hour days. Where Jesus said in John 11, verse 9, are there not 12 hours in a day? So then there's 12 hours in a night. Okay, this is one thing a young man threw at me real quickly at, down at Bill Nye. You know, he said, why can't evolution in the Bible be compatible? You know, couldn't it have been this way? And then he said something, like, when was the sun created? I said, day four, remember that? He said, yeah, day four. And then I said, when were the trees and plants created? He didn't know. I said, day three. So if you're going to make them a thousand years, how do they survive without sunlight? Got to be 24 hours. But not from Genesis 1. Something very unusual. So we got to find out when was the devil created? When were the angels created? When did they fall? And uh, what about water? When was that created? And what about the lost city of Atlantis? That might be interesting to study. The world comes up with some things once in a while. And so we'll just try to approach some of these ideas. But as I said, many times uh, an idea can be boiled down or a, a opposition can be boiled down to two, like two teams in sports. Two teams, you're not three, not four, two teams. So you get right off the beginning of the Bible, you got a choice. Creation, evolution. That's the choice. Okay, now I got the track back there. Evolution is religion. Uh, the person that wrote the preference to the origin of species, 1974, he said the same thing what I just said. He said there are only two choices for the world. Intelligent design spontaneous generation. Now, that's impressive word, spontaneous generation. <laughs> you can sell that one. Okay, and that's just evolution. So, now, on the evolutionary side, they only have two choices. Their only two choices are eternity in matter, matter's eternal, or matter created itself by itself. That's their only two choices. Both of those are overthrown by the first two laws of thermodynamics, which makes it not a science. And so if you talk with evolutionists, don't, don't deal with the experiments. Just get off all that stuff. Okay, deal with it according to logic. So there's our two choices. you got man and woman. All this stuff that people are making up is nothing but vain imaginations. You have, in the Old Testament, righteous, wicked in the New Testament, saved, lost. It's almost boiled down. If you look at all religions, it's grace or works. It's just Cain or Abel. You boil everything down to those two. And the idea is we ought to be able to look at both sides. Okay, If you think the moon is made out of green cheese, I'm not going to tell you you're an idiot. I've never seen, I've never been there, I've never tasted it, nobody's been there. Yeah, that's right, nobody's been there. Okay, maybe you got a good theory. Maybe you had a mouse that went up there and came back and said he took a bite out of it. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. When people throw around stuff saying, oh, you're ignorant, you're ignorant. Will Rogers said, we're all ignorant just on different subjects. And that's true. That's true. Uh, in... Um, the Bible word, what's our choices? Antioch, Alexandria. So it's English or unseen originals. That's the two choices. English or eclectic. That's, that's, I charge you for that one. English or eclectic. Uh, in the government, you have law and color of law. That's the contrast. You have truth, you have error, but what happens when error looks like truth? Uh, in the Bible, you have Israel and 
Egypt, Egypt, part of Babylon, part of Rome. And almost always you can narrow it down to that. The word science is found two times in the Bible. And it gives you the variations. If you would look in Daniel 1, verse 4. So we're going to... We're going to show, I'm going to show that science and the Bible are compatible. Daniel 1 verse 4, and then second, or first Timothy 6 verse 20. What Bill Nye calls science, he by accident might come across science, but most of his is pseudoscience or scientism. So what they're always going to do is they're going to try to say it's science or the Bible. And we're going to say, why would it have to be either or? It doesn't have to be either or. How can Brett Bishop go through 12 years of public school, four years of undergraduate school, two years, at least a minimum of two years of postgraduate, master's, and an earned doctorate at Purdue in biology... And walk out a Bible believer. He knew the difference between science and science falsely so called. He knew the difference. Daniel chapter 1 verse 4. What was one of the characteristics of Daniel? He understood science. He understood it. Daniel 1 4. He understood science. 1 Timothy 6 20. Uh, verses changed in every new Bible. Okay, so he tells us, he, te- he tells Timothy, watch out, you got some oppositions. What are the oppositions? That's going to overthrow the faith of some. And he said, it's science falsely so called. Falsely so called. So in our Bible, we have science and something called science that shouldn't be called science is pseudoscience or scientism. And once a person recognizes the two different things, then you can see evolutionary theory is not science. There might be some science intermingled in there, but it's really against the science theory. So, as I said, I want to go very slow slow in this, starting in Genesis, right in front of your Bible. Try to go very detailed. Uh, if you get in a discussion with somebody about evolution, say they're a Christian or something like that, a good way to get out of the argument, just say, well, do you know Jesus Christ believed in the creation? Do you feel confident calling Jesus Christ a liar? Mark 13, verse 19. He believed in the creation. Now, if they feel confident saying that, I say, oh, okay. It's your funeral, not mine. So, in, very detailed, in, the word in occurs 12,674 times in the Bible. So, Abby, you and Callie, I want you to take that under your study, okay? So, you're going to start that. The word the occurs 64,041 times in the Bible, according to Sword Searcher. So, Lucas, Abram, David, Abram, David. Okay, you guys got that one. Okay, so next week you've got to write out every verse with N. So that's only 6,000 Ps. No problem. You can do it during study hall or break. And the guys, you've got 64,000. Just divide that amongst yourself. So in the beginning, God created the heaven singular. Notice singular. All the new Bibles, plural it. Very significant. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. So what did God do? He created a continuum of time, space, matter. Time, space, and matter. That is the beginning of a trinity. Time, space, and matter. Time, you have past, present, future. Okay? Space, you have length. Breath, we so often say with, the Bible word is breath, and then height. Now, the Bible throws another idea, another perspective in there called depth. That would be Ephesians, that steps into the spirit world, probably. 
Now, in matter, you have solid, liquid, or gaseous, or vapor. Okay, so vapor or gas, whatever. Okay, that's matter. Now, what's significant about matter is density. Density is the molecules within a certain given volume. And when the molecules are real tight, dense, it will sink in water. It will sink in the air. If the molecules are spread out, like helium, clouds, smoke, it floats. Those things don't have a, quote, anti-gravity device. That's a natural law. That is a better law. That is a law where gravity is a theory. The man that came up with it said it's a theory, but people are saying it's a fact. <laughs> I don't know. There might be something better. There might be, and that's where density or buoyancy steps in. Okay, so in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, God is the energy force. Okay, God with energy and force created. The word create, if you run that throughout the Bible, that is making something out of nothing. Where made and formed is taking the elements or the matter and refiguring it to become something else. So he did all four of those during the creation story. You have he created something out of nothing. He made, he formed, and then he said. Those are four different things that the Lord did. Uh, he have dual entities in Genesis 1 verse 2. In the beginning, God, you have dual entities. The entities are the difference between heaven and earth. Where heaven, invisible, earth, visible. If you would, look in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. And then uh, we could, uh, on your way to Colossians, maybe we can take a stop in in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. So Romans 1, 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. So we're back in Genesis 1, verse 1. So we have something visible, earth, okay? Something invisible, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and God has so it there without excuse. So when somebody attacks the creation truth, they're attacking the Godhead. They are replacing the Godhead with their intellect. This idea of the evolutionary theory is a big deal. And if you read Romans down there, you'll see the evolutionary theory teacher in verse 22. That's where he gets his title. Okay, he gets the professor. And then verse 23 is evolution in reverse. Where he says, glory of an uncorruptible God, image, corruptible man, birds, beasts, creeping things. If you read that backwards, that's the evolutionary theory. Okay, and the end result, when a society bases their culture on this theory, the end result will be verse 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, how are we looking in our country? That's the end result. So you know prophecy from that. Okay, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. Visible and invisible. Colossians 1, 18. Who is the image of the invisible God? Who is that? Jesus Christ. The firstborn of every creature. Very first person born of God is Jesus Christ. Adam wasn't born again. Moses wasn't born again. None of those guys got born again. First one is Jesus Christ. 
And then it says, For by Him, so Jesus Christ was there, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities, there's something about the creation of principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. So we're getting a hint here when Satan was created. Okay, in the beginning, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. 1 Timothy chapter 6. So we have a, a dual entities back in Genesis 1. We have invisible, visible. 1 Timothy 6, verse uh, fifth, uh, verse 15, which in times past he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. So there we have the word immortality. So that brings us into another realm of immortality and mortality or a mortuary. And that's where we run to 1 Corinthians 15. So like I say, most of the time you can boil things down to two uh, differences, two opposing forces. And it's wise to look at both sides. Look at both sides. A lot of times people say, I don't want to listen to your side. No, listen to it. There's a reason for those things. Try to figure it out. I like to listen to people. I like reading um, opposing viewpoints. If I see something on YouTube against uh, dispensations, I like to watch it. I enjoy watching those because it shows me, okay, maybe I need to shore this up. I can see where they're at fault. I can see where they're wrong. Okay, Calvinism, I know, that kind of gets draggy. That gets boring if I watch that stuff. But this one guy I was just watching recently, 15 minute low, is a quickie on sovereign grace and Calvinism. He's a Calvinist. But toward, right at the, I knew he was going to let the cat out of the bag toward the end. He decided that Calvinism was compatible with the Bible. Whoa, you can't do that in Calvinism. You can't decide. You gotta be born a Calvinist. Because it takes away your free will. It takes away your intellect. So in 1 Corinthians 15, we have several dual entities. You have mortal and immortal. You have corruptible and incorruptible. And then you have heavenly and earthy. Okay, heavenly and earthy. And in 46, you have spiritual and natural. In verse 47, you have earthy and heaven. So there's our dual entities all the way through there in Genesis 1. Okay, natural, that's what the Founding Fathers put in the uh, Declaration of Independence. Nature's God. Because they're looking at the natural aspect of it. Okay, now God, in Genesis 1, and this is one thing, you can do Genesis 1, God with energy and force created. Why? Why? An evolutionist, why are you here? Well, a bunch of matter, electri electrical charge got together and magically, just accidentally, here I am. So you have electrical charges running through your brain and just... And you think that, that you came to a conclusion? No, your conclusion is an accident. You're an accident. Everything you do is an accident. Bill Nye is an accident. It's just by sheer chance. I mean, they got no hope. They have no hope. Why did God create? If you would, Isaiah 45, verse 18. Why did God create the heaven and the earth? He had a reason. Children learn how to live life by playing. 
Boys get the car. I used to get tractors out, planters. When I, when I got enough courage to go in that one boogeyman room in our back room, and we're in a two-story farmhouse, when I got the courage to finally go back there, <laughs> I put some strings up, and I had a field, another field, and I'd drive my tractor in there. I wouldn't be back in a boogeyman room at nighttime. No way. That was off limits. <laughs> Uh, and so what do I do? I was preparing for life. When girls play with dolls, what are they doing? They're playing with life, practicing life. What is God doing when he created the earth? He's a kid playing with toys. He has an interest in the toys. He has an interest in the inhabitants. Isaiah 55 verse, or 45 verse 18. It's not sacrilegious. It's not belittling God. It's just showing that what we are made of. He says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it. Notice all the wording in there. Create, form, all in that, made. Several words used. Through there, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. Okay, so he made it to be inhabited. So what is he doing with the inhabitants? Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Verse 13, what's the purpose? Okay, the purpose of the creation is God has an interest in its inhabitants. Psalm 33, 13, the Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men from the place of his habitation. He looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. He's looking down on them. Looking down on them. Not looking down around to see them. (laughs) He's looking right down on them. He has an interest in them. So why did he create us? I like the verse that Sam Gipp says is the Bible in a nutshell. Revelation 4.11. He created all things for his pleasure. So... An evolutionary kid has no purpose in life. He has no value. He has no one he could pray to. And that's why eat, drink, and be merry. And that's why they're miserable. They say, oh, you people that got a Bible, you need religion as a crutch. You need marijuana as a crutch. Or Coke or whatever other chemical, that's what you need to have in order to deal with life. Okay, but the Lord created, therefore we have a purpose. And what is our purpose? If we meet our purpose in life, our purpose is to please our God. People say, well, that's kind of arrogant. Yeah, but when you buy something, don't you buy it for your pleasure? You buy it if you have a dog that falls out of your pleasure. What do you do with it? Depends if you're raised in a country or in a city. (laughs) I know what we do with them in the country. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) if it falls out of our pleasure. (laughs) Okay, but uh, that's how we live our lives. Okay, so God is no different. He does things for his pleasure. So we do things for our pleasure. Okay, so the word create, formed, made. Create is something out of nothing. Okay, made. Okay, I read Psalm. Uh, I see. I read Isaiah forty-five twelve. Let's see Isaiah forty-five forty-three seven. Isaiah forty-three seven. Here is where all three words are used. Isaiah forty-three seven. Okay, even everyone that is called by my name. In this context, it will be Israel, up there in verse 3. 
For I have created him for my glory. So that would be Israel was created. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Three different terms there. Now you want to see a real blessing for New Testament? Let's try Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. So that, that's an idea of the create, formed, and made. You can run that in the Bible through, throughout the Bible if you choose to do. It get really detailed. Here is a great blessing for the New Testament believer. At the moment you got saved, at the moment you got saved, God did something miraculous. Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What did he create? Chapter 4, verse 24. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The first time you were born, you were born in the image of your mom and dad. Okay, the second time you're born, you're born in the image of God. He creates a new man, something out of nothing. Okay, that's the new man. Now, that is a unique position to be in. And that gives a, per a person purpose in life. Okay, so when we understand that, then we can understand what is our purpose in life. And it's to please the Lord. And when a person fulfills their purpose then life has meaning. A lot of people just don't have no meaning in life. Life is just nothing to them. And the reason why in Ephesians 2, it says they are without hope, having no hope, and without God in the world. And that's where the world's at. So, uh, we'll go back to Genesis 1. Next week we'll start in in the, the beginning, and I'll run several passages that uh, describe events that take place in the beginning when God created time, space, matter. Okay, so that's when he created it right then. But he also did something in that where we read the other places, we find out what he did, then we find out what happened in verse 2, then we find out from verse 3, then it goes into something different. Now, uh, the one idea is that this is one way you could tell if a person is a true Bible believer. Is when you go to Genesis one twenty nine, ask them if the word replenish is the right word. Ken Hoven will run to Hebrew and change it. And yet he claims to be a Bible believer. He's not. Not when you get changed in words, you're not. You're a TR guy, just be honest. You say, I'm a TR guy. And I'll respect you more if you admit it, then, then you claim to hold to the King James and then start changing words. Okay, it's just better to be honest about it. And I had a fella that has since passed away. He, he didn't want to accept this idea of replenish and plenish. Or is it verse 28? I think it's verse 28. Replenish. He said, if I would see it in a dictionary where the word plenish means to fill, I think I would believe that. So I went over to my shelf. Got an Oxford dictionary. It's about that thick. Looked up the word plenish. Turned it around. Pushed it to him. <laughs> How about that? Oh. He, he, he told me what he said, and I didn't really know what to expect. I never looked it up before. Never heard the word plenish before. Well, there's a farm, I think, an herbicide called plenish. But, <laughs> oh well, that's how it goes. When people have their mind made up, don't confuse me with the facts. I got my mind made up. And that's how it goes. And that, oh, that's all you do. It's not a big deal. I don't, no hurt friendship. If he chose, that's his choice. I don't care. Just to, in, in my mind, it makes more sense in my mind, and I can rest with that. 
Okay, we'll stop there. Lord, I do pray and ask you'd help us as we continue to study down through this idea that you'd give us insight, help us to make it clear, plain. And Lord, if we cross something that might go against uh, what we've been taught, help us, well, at least consider it. Consider it. And then ask for light. And if you want to give some more light, fine and dandy. If you say, no, you got enough, then I'm uh, not going to worry about it. Uh, Lord, it's amazing that you show us anything in this book. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.